Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Everyone in the rural town often commented on his physical strength, stamina, and endurance. Tall and strong, he easily bested every boy his age in physical skills. He had plenty of lean muscle from hours of hard physical labor. And while he excelled at running and jumping and was even an accomplished axe thrower, it was wrestling that he enjoyed the most. In fact, by the time he was 21, he'd won every single match he entered, becoming the reigning champion in America. Needless to say, he was good. Really good. And he knew it. In a biography written many years later, it was said that after one particular wrestling match, he looked out into the crowd and declared himself the big buck of the sport, and challenged anyone who thought differently to step on up and give it their best. Now, his claim might have sounded a bit arrogant coming from anyone else, but the townsfolk knew he was right. He could back all that talk up, after all. He'd competed in over 300 matches and had lost only once after taking a bad step and falling. Bold statements aside, though, the townsfolk liked him. He had a solid reputation for being forthright, hardworking, kind, and dependable. Boasting wasn't usually his thing, so if he claimed that he was the best, well, then he was. Not a single person accepted his challenge. He wasn't the only champion wrestler in the area, though. Another wrestler about the same age lived just one county over, and by some accounts he was as big and strong as a Russian bear. His name even sounded like a formidable wrestler, Jack Armstrong. And Jack Armstrong had a fan club of sorts, a gang of troublemakers called the Clary Grove Boys. For laughs, they once put a drunk into a barrel and closed it tight, and then rolled him down a hill. If the barrel hadn't broken on a tree, it would have plunged into the river, Another time, they burned a man's wooden leg, forcing him to watch. I'd venture to say that they were the only ones laughing at their attempt at a joke. Jack kept hearing great things about his neighboring rival, and decided that he and his gang needed to rough him up a bit. But our local hometown champion talked him into a fair fight instead. Or so he thought. Jack, certain that his bear-like strength and bulk outmatched his much taller and lean-built competitor, agreed to the challenge but Jack would soon find out that he was wrong about that. The two men squared off on a dusty street on a sunny afternoon like Old West gunslingers. Spectators gathered to watch, and a few even placed bets. Moments into the match, however, those who'd bet on Jack realized their mistake. Jack's friends had circled around, jabbing and punching and even attempting to kick the legs out from the taller man. It was clearly underhanded, and the crowd jeered, Instead of stooping to the gang's level, our champion simply lifted Jack off his feet and slammed him to the ground. Then he offered to take Jack's friends on one by one, after he finished with Jack, of course. And that's when something interesting happened. Jack Armstrong called off his gang and admitted defeat. The story goes that Jack was so taken with his rival's handling of the situation and the crowd's admiration of him that he changed his ways to become more like his competitor. In fact, the two would eventually become good friends. The lesson hadn't gone unnoticed by our small-town hero, either. He'd made a lasting impression on those attending, and changed a bully into someone who cared for others. Learning how to fight fair and having the courage to do the right thing would become key qualities for the rest of his life. But for all his talent as a wrestler, that's just a tiny part of his accomplishments. You see, after leaving his small hometown, he went on to serve in the military— became an accomplished public speaker, a lawyer, a writer, and a U.S. senator. And in 1992, 127 years after his death, he was also awarded a spot in the Wrestling Hall of Fame. A pretty nice achievement, but certainly not his biggest. No, that would be the time he climbed his way to the top of American politics, becoming the 16th president of the United States, and later, the author of the Gettysburg Address. Abraham Lincoln.
With the American 28th Division flanking their right and the French 4th Army flanking their left, Major Whittlesey led 550 men from different troops past the significantly wired and guarded post of the Argonne Forest. Their mission was to reach Hill 198. On October 2nd of 1918, they made their way through the dense forest. And while they encountered some resistance while capturing Hill 198, they had no idea that the rest of the Americans and the French had come under heavy fire and had to turn back. Soon, the Germans closed in, circling Whittlesley and his men. The Major sent runners to get help, but they were either captured by Germans or killed before reaching safety. The Major soon realized their predicament. With only two choices, to either hold their ground or attempt to retreat, he and his men agreed to stay and fight at all costs. So they dug in, firing back and holding down the hill with everything they had. For five days, those men fought bravely, withstanding one assault of gunfire and grenade attack after another. Food and ammunition ran low. The only water available meant crawling to a stream while under sniper fire, and the Germans cut off all radio communications. And then, things got worse. The battalion came under friendly fire from the Americans, who had mistaken the lost battalion for the enemy. So Whittlesey sent a carrier pigeon to the nearby American forces telling them to stop their fire. Yes, a carrier pigeon. You see, back then, radios were heavy and not always reliable. Connecting the wires quickly was not only difficult but often dangerous. Carrier pigeons, on the other hand, were fast, flying at close to 50 miles per hour, and they proved to be much more reliable, too. Because of this, German machine gunners often targeted the birds. Stop the bird, stop the message. The Germans shot down every bird the battalion sent. They'd taken heavy casualties. Bandages were in such short supply that they were removed from the dead and reused on the living. The men honestly couldn't last much longer. But they had one bird left. A female named Cher Ami. The Major jotted down one last message. We are along the road parallel 276.4. American artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. For heaven's sake, make it stop. As soon as they sent the bird on her mission, a shell exploded beneath her, killing five men. Others watched in horror and despair as Cher Ami fluttered in the sky, disoriented and desperately avoiding gunfire. A bullet grazed her chest sending Feathers and Cher Ami spiraling to the ground. Their last hope was gone. Except that it wasn't. That little bird, now blind in one eye and with a serious wound in her chest, took flight once more. Cher Ami seemed as determined to live as the men who had sent her. For 25 miles, she flew through enemy lines, dodging wave after wave of machine gun fire and every attempt to shoot her down. Meanwhile, the men hung on for another 45 minutes, and then, as suddenly as it began, the friendly fire stopped. For a moment, there was silence, before the sound of mortars started up again, this time hitting the Germans. With hope restored, the remaining men continued to fight. Five days later, the Germans were driven back. On October 8th, 194 survivors from the Lost Battalion made their way safely to American territory all thanks to the sacrifice of little Cher Ami. But Cher Ami's story doesn't end there. Soon she was given one of France's most honored awards for her bravery on the battlefield. American General John Pershing said, There isn't anything the United States can do too much for this bird. On the day Cher Ami arrived at her destination, bleeding and weary, medics had rushed to save her. They amputated her leg and removed the shrapnel. And miraculously, Cher Ami lived. For her valor, she was returned to her trainer and handler in New Jersey. Cher Ami, the carrier pigeon who saved the lost battalion from the Germans and friendly fire, passed away on June 13th of 1919. Her heroics and her name will never be forgotten. After all, Cher Ami is French for Dear Friend. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. 
And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.